Fantastic. Welcome to the SQL DBM 2023 review and roadmap and sneak peek, a celebration of everything we've managed to deliver, all of the features that we've heard from, from you guys and, and incorporated into the tool. And the most exciting part is always kind of chasing the dream and what's coming up in the year to come, which in this case is giving us quite a lot to look forward to. And we have plenty of time to cover all of these things in detail, take questions at the very end, and as always, give us your feedback, comments, feature ideas. As you can see, we, they, they are being in due time implemented and, and baked into the tool. And it's always, it's always getting bigger and, and more multifaceted. So maybe a round of introductions is in order. So I'm Serge, I'm the product success lead at SQL DBM. And we have in no particular order, Hazal. Hi everyone, I'm Hazal Shenai, the senior developer advocate on the SQL DBM team. I'm very excited to talk about the year 2023 in review. Um, so yeah, I'm so much looking forward to start. Gordon. Hi, everyone. I'm Gordon Wong. I am an advisor over here at uh, SQL DBM. I am a longtime data modeler, database architect, um, and sometimes I think of myself as uh, one of the number one customers for SQL DBM. Okay. Keith. Hey, everybody. Keith Belanger here, and I'm the product um, evangelist here at SQL DBM. I've been here for a quarter of a year already um, and excited to share and communicate and talk about uh, what we've done this past year and yeah, looking forward to it. Okay. So each of us are going to cover a separate section of this webinar. So we're, we won't be arguing or talking over each other. So let's get into it and then questions will be in open buffet. So let me share my screen. So on our agenda today are some of the bigger items that we've released over the course of the year. And as I mentioned, we'll also save some time for the bigger features on the roadmap and then take an overview and, and questions from, from the audience if you have some. By all means, um, either shout them out uh, when we open the floor or leave them in, in the comments if we're able to, if you're able to leave comments. And yeah, without further ado, let's let's dive in. So let's start with Snowflake enhancements. And in this case, the there's a lot of new functionality that Snowflake is releasing. Some of it is just now rolling over to general access or public preview, things like dynamic tables and many other new table types that are on our roadmap for the coming year. So this year we took a dive into the metadata tags and we introduced tags in SQL DBM. And this gives the users both the ability to, with everything you would expect of SQL DBM to reverse engineer the object, to modify the object, to edit the, the tag themselves, as well as the assignment. So you can assign tags on the on your database assets. You can also, they've been worked into the UI, so you can use them as, as filters and references for find all the you know, tagged items based on this tag or based on this tag value. And we're expanding that in the coming year to include masking policies and the row access policies as well in a similar fashion. So they work both on the diagrams as well as the database documentation screen. And it just gives a bigger um, user, I guess, profile access to, to the kind of modeling that you would do. Not only is it just the architects that are administering the structure of your objects, but also the governance team is able to come in and set policies and flags and tags labels accordingly. The other big item that a lot of big in terms of uh, how much request we've been hearing for this feature is SSO. So this came towards the end of the year in 
the last release, in fact. Uh, so a lot of you might not have started using it yet, but just so everyone is aware, SSO is officially available for Direct Connect to Snowflake. What this means is specifically, this is this is uh, we've released it for Snowflake as as kind of the first iteration. It will be available for other cloud data platforms, and it is separate for is a separate functionality for from the SSO login into SQL DBM tool. So this is configured separately, and if you wish to use it for your Snowflake connections. It's in the admin panel, uh, so admins or alternative admins can set this up and just provide the details from your Snowflake configuration, and it'll let you kind of pass through without having to use username and password. So right now, this is Azure AD or Enter ID, as they're calling it now, with OAuth, and Okta is coming soon. And the next one, I'm, I'm going to mention it specifically because I just keep banging on about this point. It's, it was such a small detail to, to implement into the tool, but it opens up such a wealth of possibilities for Snowflake users in terms of cost savings and performance and just user experience and has potentially game-changing ramifications for how you design views and your data models and your reporting layer. So what I'm referring to is the rely property for constraints. So as, as a data modeling tool and as data modeling advocates, of course, we're going to tell you to declare your constraints. They help with usability, readability, uh, self-service. You can look at the structure or the definition of a table and you can see the granularity defined by the primary key. You can see the relationships defined by foreign keys. Um, regardless of whether or not Snowflake enforces these, they're, they're just very helpful. Even third-party tools like reporting tools will take advantage of them to inform joins and and there's no reason not to declare them. They're, they'll never work against you. There's no performance penalty. But where Rely comes in is Snowflake has built a killer feature on the back of this Rely property, which before was just uh, for, for compatibility. It didn't do anything. And this feature that I'm referring to is join elimination. So join elimination uh, essentially means if you don't need a join, Snowflake doesn't perform the join. So if you have a view, that let's say has several, uh, let's say a large fact table with several dimensions hanging off of it, you can safely build a, a view with all of those joins built in and give it to your business users with the rely property. When they query the view, let's say they only hit the fact table or they only hit some dimensions from the fact and maybe one or two of the, the dimension tables, only those joins will get executed by the query engine. So it used to be a very a, a very tight bottleneck in terms of performance when you, you you were forced to a lot of times include a lot of dimensions for different teams and domains since they're all pointing at the same, let's say, sales table or booking table. And they use different dimensions to to um, slice and dice their data. Now you can do that without performance penalties using the rely property. So the rely property is a property that you just add the keyword rely at the end of your constraint definition. And Snowflake will do its best to ignore those when those when those columns are not used in the join. So I encourage everyone to read up on Snowflake join elimination. We have articles on our Medium page that explain how they work and how to use it. And I think it's a game changer. So just make sure you're aware of this functionality and, and the way you design front-facing reports and data sources. And as I said, this is, this is what we've built this year. Next year, we will talk about external tables. We'll talk about all the other dynamic tables and Iceberg and everything else that Snowflake is, is working on. But for now, let's switch to a non-Snowflake enhancement, which is user groups. 
user groups is a feature that we built again based on feedback from our customers who have told us that essentially we have uh, teams coming and going we have engineers coming on consultants rolling onto a project we like to bulk manage our project access every time someone new joins i don't want to have to add them to 20 different projects user groups allow us to do just that they allow an admin to take sql dbm users put them in a group and then assign those groups as if they were individual users to a project so you can take let's say all your analysts add them to any projects they might need access to give them uh, in one click sort of the appropriate level of access whether that's modeler or viewer and then tomorrow when you're when you hire a new analyst you don't have to go through that same uh, process for every single project you just add them to a group or remove them from a group and the access to projects is handled likewise for for everyone so it makes uh, bulk adding of users a lot easier and a lot simpler um, managing teams uh, also much faster again if you have kind of teams that are always changing based on project or you have consultants coming and going it's it's a great great feature to have and it's available on our enterprise plans so be sure you're digging around in the admin menu or reminding your admins that they have this feature available Okay, so let me pass it over to Gordon. And this year we've not only included uh, data modeling features, we've branched out into complete new domains, which we're starting to refer to as, as hubs. And we've we've included several new hubs that are that are kind of adjacent to to the modeling piece of, of our tool. And Gordon is going to talk about the observability hub. Thanks, Serge. So the when we talk about hubs in, uh, in SQL DBM, this is not so much a, a, a explicit product feature, like there's not an observability hub tab within the application. It's more of a logical or conceptual concept, a little bit like modeling. So it's a little bit meta here, right? What we mean by observability, though, is really going from beyond like a standalone tool that just creates creates a model, has one particular feature, but really thinking about how does it fit into the overall life cycle of building, maintaining, and delivering value via databases and other data sets, right? So the observability hub is our label or our way of thinking, the basket for containing all these things that allow us to understand what we're producing and it's and how it's being used, right? And the the, the core feature that we're really starting with here is this notion of schema monitoring, right? So DB schema monitoring is like addressed, we were already creating models, right? And we had a way to store them in source code control. And we had a way to diff them, right? These are all features from an engineering perspective. Uh, one of, the, one of the, the angles I push coming from perspective of someone who is frequently a budget holder or running a department is that I'm looking for like functionality to help that makes allows me to deliver more value to end users. And SQL DBM responded by producing schema monitoring. And what schema monitoring really is, is the ability to look at a database, right? Look at a schema within database, whether it be your warehouse or your source systems or someplace else, and detect changes. But not just and then that's that's a bit of data, right? But detect once we've detected those changes, creating ways for people to be aware of those changes, right? It's not enough just to detect them. People need to know that it's there so they can respond to them. So we have monitoring jobs that will go out and reach out to our, our systems or our source systems or our target systems, right? And look for these changes. We're going to find the drift. What's the delta? What's the difference, right? You know, produce that in a condensed form that we can both track and review and that we can consume. So we will produce a report for that. Uh, you can see that within the UI, you can look, you can drill right into the exact field change, the name change, the data type change, and so on, right? Um, and then you could, you have an opportunity as a someone who's in production or what have you to react to those changes before things break, right? I mean, anyone who's ever ran a warehouse in production has had a pipeline that got broken because something changed upstream and you didn't know about it, right? And it's really expensive to go back and fix, whether it be in the middle of the night or reloading data or what have you. So, you know. 
schema monitoring and the observability hub helps you detect those changes, right, as they're happening. And you, by the way, you could be monitoring a development environment, right? It's not just production, right? You could be you could be monitoring a development environment and then being aware of those changes before they even make it into production. Um, so and then you know and then this is part of the thinking of again we're generating this data this knowledge or information around the your models um, those changes are being put into our own data store right our repos and so on but there's this thinking that and I would love to get feedback from the audience at some point about like you know how much further can we go from an analytics perspective here thinking as an analyst so now we we one feature we're already rolling out and search that on the next slide about the timeline. Or is it on here? I'm squinting a little bit. Oh, there we go. Visual change log is a way to more conveniently see those changes, right? So not just like being aware that, hey, this ver the, the database changed from one version to another, but rather, what's the nature of change from my database? How often does it happen, right? You know, the, in the beginning, we know that in the beginning of a project, you're going to see a lot of different changes, right? And it may slow down over time, too. You know, being able to see those trends can be pretty helpful. You know, whether it be from a staffing perspective or being aware that something is volatile, right? So this is an example of taking an analytics view to monitoring changes within our, our models, right? And I think I'm really excited because that's only, I think it's only the tip of the iceberg there, right? There's, I think there's, once we start you thinking like analysts, thinking like people who are making recommendations, there's so much more you can do. Right? Yeah. And that's a great point, actually, that you made that um, hubs, uh, it, they're not specific products, they're not specific add-ons, they're more of a conceptual understanding where certain features might fall, uh, even though they're available in one or another product or the tool itself. So there will be features added to SQL DBM or related products that fall across these categories. So we will talk about further um enhancements to the data governance hub which keith is going to describe next to the observability hub which are not going to be part of schema monitoring necessarily and obviously the data modeling hub which is the the bread and butter of of what we do here so let, let's turn it over to keith so he can talk about the data governance hub Great, thanks, Serge. And um, yeah, kind of building on what Gordon was talking about in terms of um, features that help an organization um, beyond just the data modeling and, and the data governance hub to me was a, a, one of my uh, favorite uh, add-ons and, and extensions to uh, SQL DBM this past year. And um, having been um, in organizations and in, in trying to make sure that as you're modeling and you're designing your uh, data structures and stuff like that is also understanding uh, well what's the what's the usage where's this data coming from um getting more information about these structures um you know data governance is, is a important aspect of an organization but oftentimes i've i've found that when you're doing your modeling and then you deploy that into your database your governance would become a reactionary type of you know thing you'd have to do it after the fact with the data governance hub and these features is now we're able to shift left some of that data governance um, practices when's the best time to be documenting um your your table structures or which what columns and what is you know, the definition of those columns and maybe if there's PII information but is at the time you're de you're designing when you're the hood is open I like to say and you're really discussing that design and you're modeling it that's the best time to excuse me capture this information versus months later and say oh now we got to go back and maybe the person who was doing that is gone and you're reworking it so again i like to say let's shift left some of this stuff while we're doing the design work um enhance your user adoption of what you're creating if you're delivering these data structures and right out of the the gate you have the definitions and critical information about that data structure at that time that's important um and being able to customize that documentation um so that you're you're meeting the needs in your communication with your business in terms of uh what is critical for stakeholders other technical folks and even your business to understand um, those data structures so let's dive into this a little bit more in terms of the actual features within the governance hub 
So the first is we have fields. So what is fields allows you to do as an organization is add the metadata that is important to you. You know, every organization might be different. There might be common themes, but what is important to you, it could be things like um, who's the data owner of this data? What's the data classification? How often is this data refreshed? You know, really it's up to you in terms of what you want to capture. And so this is the ability to customize uh, those metadata components. Now, how can you manage those? You know, you might want to bulk manage that stuff. You could export this out into an Excel template and you can manipulate that data. Maybe you have more than one people adding some of that information in and then re-importing that in. Maybe you already have a, a spreadsheet of, of information you've been capturing and you want to copy paste it in. The other part too that is is a great feature of this if the organizations that are leveraging DBT, you have the ability to add these custom metadata to your YAML that we create inside SQL DBM. So now you could leverage this metadata within your, um, your DBT models to maybe do a level of automation and stuff on top of that leveraging. So, hey, I know this is PII. I need to make sure in my, in my DBT model that I'm doing something with that data. So again, taking going beyond the, the just the, the standard modeling and adding richness to the metadata and the governance aspects um, at that time of modeling. So that's fields. So the next uh, feature that we have is reports. So now that you've captured this metadata, how can people consume it, understand it, search it? So we have our uh, report feature, which is an HTML formatted report that you could share with others who are consumers of SQL DBM, and they can navigate around and say, hey, which what are the, the technical metadata about these tables or columns uh, or structures? What is the logical? So maybe what's the logical name? What's the definition? Definitions are already important. And those custom metadata fields that we talked about and rich text search. So if I just say, hey, I want to see everything that has the word customer in it, whether it's a table name or a column name or it's in a, a description, you're e uh, um, easy to find that and then navigate to it again the ability to export this out into Excel if people want to look at that metadata in that fashion. And then the last component of um, the hub is pages. Um, again, I think this is a, a another one of my favorite features that was part of the governance is this now really is gives you the artistic freedom to build basically an internal wiki with the side SQL DBM, being able to bring that, maybe it's that top down perspective, like start to bridge the gap between your business and IT in terms of, you know, hey, maybe it's building a business glossary in terms of what is the definition of customer and then linking to the physical structures that support that. Maybe it's even the attributes or diagrams that support that. So you can kind of bring that story of how do I come from, hey, I want to do this type of analysis you know, what is that type of analysis? And then here's where that data is physically located. So you can add links to objects in the diagrams. You could add links to, maybe you have an intranet site that has information on your business um, data policy. You can link to that so people can easily get to it. So again, it's a very um, rich, you can set, it's a, like I said, it's a wiki with inside SQL DBM. You can have nested pages and it really gives you that freedom to build um, what you need, again, to help your consumers, whether they're technical or business, to better understand their data ecosystem and then link it to the actual uh, models there. So those at the moment are the three core components of our governance hub to kind of build on what Gordon was saying about the um, observability, observability, I can't even say it, observability, um, is this is the tip of the iceberg, not the, uh, so much more that we're going to be able to do in the governance space. Um, I'm really excited for, for these features and what's to come in, in this space. And with that, Serge, I'll hand it back over to you. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, so next, we're going to talk about new database support, and we'll hand it over to Hazal, who will explain what we've added this year and officially covering all of the popular relational cloud data platforms are now supported by SQL DBM. So let's hand it over to Hazal. 
Thank you very much, Serge. So we released the direct connection to Databricks and Google BigQuery, but before going into much detail, I would like to provide the kind of brief information, the reason why we integrated with those databases. So regardless which databases we are talking about today, all the databases are meeting on the same ground, which is the database modeling. Because database modeling is not a built-in feature in the databases. So you can create a table, you can store data, you can write the queries, but entity relationship diagrams creation is not going to be possible in your database. ER diagrams are very essential because they are describing your database structure where the data is stored, right? The data is stored on the database structure. And that's the reason why the database modeling is very important. And because the database modeling also acts like a skeleton of your database, data platforms. Because just to kind of giving a sample example, you can create a table. The table can live without any data inside in the database, but a data cannot live without any database entities in the database, right? So that's the reason the database structure is very important. It has to be very well structured before you start in storing the data, even after. And that's why the database modeling is important. And that's the common uh, concerns of all the databases that we are talking about today. So we can continue to the next slide for looking at a little bit the timeline when we did release the integrations. So in February, we introduced the Databricks Direct Connection using the engineering clusters and following the other connection method, which is the API, it was released in June. So the first connection method actually integrates with the high meta store and the Unity catalog and it uses the engineering clusters, which is the cons uh, compute resources, right? And the other one, which is the API, it integrates with the Unity catalog and doesn't require any compute resources. And following on the timeline in July, we also introduced the Google BigQuery direct connection, which is similar to uh, Databricks. You can directly connect with uploading the connection file. We are going to review how this is going to work in the tool, how it looks like visually. And in October, we also provide the Google BigQuery users and being able to create their author uh, statements in the tool because our tool doesn't only reverse engineer and visualize what you have. You can also apply the schema changes and the need would be probably creating the author statement, not creating everything from scratch with the create statements. And at the next slide, we are going to review how the Databricks direct connection works. And then we are also going to see what the Databricks uh, special objects that we are supporting. And here, uh, basically, we are connecting the Databricks using the API method and introducing the credentials. And basically select the data catalog and then a schemas. And the tool is going to visualize uh, everything on the right side. You can see the table features. And please continue search because there is an option that we would like to show, which is the partitioning keys. There you can uh, select the members if you would like to add a new partitioning key. Either you can edit the existing partitioning key that is already reverse engineered. And the Bloom filter index, which is Databricks special, is going to work in the same way. You can uh, select the members, also edit the existing one. And can I go so that? those a little bit. <laughs> Um, yeah, file formats, um, and those are the table properties. Uh, this uh, data governance features of Databricks. You can reverse engineer them. You can edit an existing uh, property, also add a new property from scratch using SQL DBM. Uh, Search, maybe you can just go over, um, continue playing the video, not stopping. That would be yeah. much better, probably. Thank you. And so this is the column level properties basically define a kind of expression. It's going to give us generated always uh, statements. And at the next slide, we will review at the high level of the objects that are supported in SQL DBM, but it is not limited by this as we were reviewing earlier. Schemas, tables, views, Bloom filter index, check constraints, uh, constraints, table file formats, properties, partitions, even the materialized views is supported, but it's not here in the list, and there are more to come. There will be more objects are going to be supported for special data rigs. And at the next slide, we are going to review how to um, directly connect to 
Google BigQuery is going to be similar, just uploading the connection file, selecting the data set and apply, and the tool will parse the DDL, underline the objects of your database, and you can organize it a little bit. On the right side, now we will see the column level properties, right? Like, let's click on the column and there we will see the data type, which is struck. And this is also a Google BigQuery feature. And on the table, you will see on the right console, there are some options that you can edit an existing column, add a new column, and there are more options that we are seeing here now, partitioning keys and clustering keys. And you can also define some expirations, uh, timestamp or some days if it is needed. And collation is also supported like binary, UND. And on the next slide is very similar to the Databricks one. We will see the high level of uh, objects that are supported for Google BigQuery. And additional to this list, tags and labels are a roadmap item. This is what is also going to be supported in the future. And so the next slide, please, the next slide is going to cover the security part. And we also released the security features. They came under the Enterprise Plus. So you might ask me the question why the security is important if you are talking about the table structure, the list of the columns and the data types like bar card number. This obviously not only securing the data type, uh, also it is uh, beyond of this table or view structure, right? Because when we talk about the metadata, it should cover everything, including the data governance Kit was uh, talking earlier, like pages reports there, there can be kind of uh, sensitive data that you wouldn't like to share out of the organization. Even the view, because the view is a part of the DDL, but the view can have a filter where condition customer phone number in and all the phone numbers, or where the customer, any kind of sensitive information can be inside a view as well. It is more beyond of the table structure, securing the metadata, thinking that it covers actually what is written or even the team communication in the tool can be some um, uh, sensitive team communication. So uh, one piece of the security uh, feature is regional storage. What it does that it is likely keeping your metadata close to your home where the company operates. And the second one is the customer managed storage. It allows uh, users to uh, host their metadata on their preferred cloud platforms like Azure Blob, AWS, S3 Bucket, or uh, even uh, Google Cloud uh, Platform as well. So the private link uh, reduces the potential threats on the public network. So it really makes sure only the company can access the tool. And the other two pieces, which is IP access management and the audit logs, we should continue to the next slide because there I have some screenshots to show what they look like visually. So the IP access management provides the users, the admins, giving the access or restricts to the tool, right? So you can create an IP access policy and distinct all the IP addresses to be allowed or either blocked. And this will give more control over the tool, who can access, who cannot access to the tool. On the right side, audit logs. Actually, this audit log provides uh, comprehensive information of the user activities in the tool. So an admin can come and check who was the uh, last person logging into tool and which is the user IP and what operation system was used. Was it Windows or Mac OS or any uh, timestamp? When was the last login time, right? So this information can be also found on the uh, audited logs. And this is now by default 30 days, but it is um, it can be changed to seven days or 90 days. If it is needed, you can also select kind of um, some uh, date range between customized, and you will be able to extract this information with uh, CSV. With that, I'm going to turn it over to search. Okay, thank you. And another uh, unexpected feature of the audit logs that we're finding are the fact that people aren't just using them for security, but also for license management within the tool. For large teams, they want to see if they have any unused seats, for example, to see who hasn't mm -hmm. logged in and rotate those accordingly. 
but lots of possibilities with with that feature so it's it's uh as a security feature should be is very well-rounded and covers all the bases so let's uh let's hand it over to keith so we've just been talking about the everything that we've kind of the timeline has shifted from everything that we've done in the past to things that are just on the verge of release so this month next month and then we'll we'll go into the future of things to come. So take it away. Great. And as you said, we're in December and um, we're going to go out of the year with I think is going to be quite of a bang. Um, the star of the month being table templates. Um, for those of you who have been doing warehousing for a while know um, there's a lot of patterns in terms of what you're doing, whether you're doing fact tables, dimensions, type one dimensions, type twos, if you're doing data vault and you're doing hubs, links, satellites, pit tables, bridges, you name it, there's a lot of reusable patterns. Table templates is gonna provide your organization the ability to build templates for the, those patterns and how you want those to be established within your organization out of the box, you know, we will have some sample templates for hubs, links, satellites, um, for dimensions and facts. But however, the flexibility in this capability is that you can use YAML and you'll be able to edit these templates to make them be what you want. So maybe you want your dimensions to be D underscore or DIM underscore and how you want that naming convention to be. If you're doing your, if you're doing type two, maybe you want to make sure you have your, your, um, your create date, your expiration date, where you want your business columns to be. Um, if you're doing uh, data vault and you want to make sure you have your hash keys and you want to make sure you have your hash diffs and you have your metadata columns the right way. I like to often say that you want to be able to do give folks the autonomy to do what they need within their teams, but at the same time set up certain guardrails. This will be a great accelerator for you to take source data structures that are coming in and quickly build yourself these pattern tables and accelerate the ability to make sure that you have that consistency and you have that standard, you have the quality and you have time to market. You might even have patterns within your organization to build what I call fit for purpose objects. Maybe you need to do some level of flattening out of certain tables or whatever it is within your organization and you want to templatize that. With our table templates, you'll be able to do that. I think this is a very exciting um, base and, and foundation to what you're going to be able to do with templates. And I'm excited for this to, to come out this month. I think we're just a few weeks away or a week away, which will be pretty exciting. Some other things, I don't have anything, a slide on it, but I do want to mention that are going to be coming out this month. So those who are using Confluence for their diagrams, you'll be able to um, be able to subject area selection in that. Um, the visual change log is going to have some new features so that you can search within that change log. And Gordon was kind of showing you that earlier. So additional features on that. Also be able to change that timeline to say, I want to see it in a week, week increment, day increment. Um, we're going to be enhancing some of the altering capabilities in your DDL within Snowflake. Um, and those who want to have local um, blob storage for your metadata that SQL DBM has, the ability to store that in Azure Blob is coming. So again, we're going out the year with some some new great features uh, coming out and keep an eye on them for the next couple of weeks to come. Right back to you, Serge. Okay. Um, maybe since they're kind of related to data governance and the data dictionary, do you want to cover uh, DBT fields? Or do you want me to to explain? Because that Go ahead. was supposed to be this month, but it got pushed back a little. It'll be next month. What go ahead. So okay. you can go. Go ahead. Okay. I'll, um, so DBT fields that uh, Keith was uh, alluding to in in his slides. Um, so they are they're related to governance, but they're not uh, necessary. They're not wholly a governance feature. So DBT fields, what we are releasing next month is the ability for users to maintain any DBT property, whether for sources or models, in the data dictionary. And those would be things like tests, like freshness, um, identity, quoting, um, 
even the newly, those of you who are up to the latest versions on DBT, um, contract and contract enforcement and data types and constraints. So all of that is, is not going to be part of the data governance package. It's going to be included in, in the tool for everyone. The only overlap to data governance is the fact that meta DBT fields can be taken from the governance fields. So if you want meta fields, then, then you will need data governance, but that's, uh, that's just one type of field out of the 20 or 30 plus DBT properties that we're releasing to everyone. So what that means is when we're following the, the standard traditional uh, modeling pattern of a data architect or a data modeler works with the business teams, the domains to take a requirement, build a outline, build the model of what they're going to be building, and then hands that over to an analytics engineer, they can hand that over along with the pre-built and pre-generated YAML without having to write and maintain YAML files by hand. So all of these properties that we're releasing will be available as fields in the data dictionary or data documentation, and they'll have either easy input or kind of pre-templated templates for the YAML where all you have to do is fill in the actual value or the the number of hours or days for the freshness, but the, the skeleton of the YAML will be provided for you. So it would make the handover from modeling to from relational modeling to transformational modeling very easy. So we're we're excited about DBT fields and I know a lot of our our customers are are too. So with, with that, like we can talk about the rest of the roadmap. And these are things that you can look forward to throughout the year. And obviously not by any means a limited and final list. There will be many more things that are, that are not included here. But we just wanted to mention things that are kind of top of mind and very that come up often in either customer requests or when hearing from, from the data community. Um, maybe even uh, since I, I don't want to do all the talking, we can uh, let Keith describe global modeling since that kind of falls under the, the governance hub, even though it's part of the, the modeling tool. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I know people here at SQL DBM know how excited I am here about global modeling. And I think others will be as well. But global modeling for me is taking... Uh, the data modeling that we've been doing over the years and starting to adapt it to fit the modern data practice. Many organizations, many of you out there right now are, are either doing going towards decentralized types of teams following data mesh. Um, maybe each of these teams are following, are using different types of technologies and platforms, building independent data products. So that now means the ability to have separate data models within your different teams, but at the same time, making sure you're able to interoperate with other teams. So you might have one team doing some set of data products and another team doing different data products. And for example, if you're in Snowflake, they're different databases. We're going to be introducing the ability to cross model across separate projects with inside SQL DBM. So if I want my data product or say my star schema needs a dimension that's being created by and modeled by another team. And I want to reference that and show that say dimension or fact table, whatever it might be within my project and show my consumer that there's a relationship there, you will be able to do that. So referencing across projects. So many organizations could have multiple um, teams working on multiple projects. You know, so you now have multiple modelers working on a project and you have multiple projects, all of that being able to reference one another. So you can have a vision, visual understanding of your ecosystem. Maybe you have data that's in a Snowflake and a Databricks and you want to visually show that relationship. You want to show that data flow and that data um, lineage. All of that and much more as we grow and more and more into the global modeling. But I really feel that this is now going to take those modeling capabilities and really enhance the capabilities of those organizations that are decentralized and following that data mesh um, methodology. So exciting for what to come here in that. So stay tuned. 
Okay, great. Uh, next up on the list is post API. So we released our API um, to allow users to work with the tool programmatically without having to log in and, and use the menu. So we're seeing a lot of companies now build their data models and the communication with them into their CICD pipeline. So they don't have to manually log into the tool. They can just have a deployment pipeline that just calls the API. And the API that we have released is the, the get API. So any information that you need to pull out of the tool is available in the get API that includes the definitions that includes even alter scripts and alters between environments. And what we are working on for the coming year is post API. So you'll be able to programmatically do the same thing and send and create and modify objects without having to come into the tool. So if things are being created, let's say in your ETL tool, you have um, new interfaces landing that you want to begin modeling as sources, those could be programmatically just picked up and added to your projects. And speaking of projects, like I said, we now that we've covered all of the popular databases and cloud data platforms, the next project type that we're releasing is actually no database logical projects. And this is a big one because for larger organizations, they may use multiple database source systems, multiple data cloud platforms for different types of analyses. But underpinning that is one central logical model. So logical models or logical projects are, are already in development. They'll allow users to create custom data type. They'll allow users to map those data types to the respective uh, databases that they'll be converting to and physicalizing. And will also uh, enhance and, and iterate on that feature, adding things like subtype supertypes and the ability to set up uh, conversion rules for materializing and normalizing and denormalizing those when respective of the platforms that you deploy to, as well as obviously being able to convert projects in, in part or in whole. So whether you just converting the entire logical project to another or just the latest couple of entities that you've added to that. So those are really exciting. And again, feature that comes up a lot in our, in our customer interviews and um, next up external tables. And this is again, a more and more the on cloud data platforms, this is coming up of users taking files externally, working with semi-structured files and, and interfaces that they receive. So all of the cloud data platforms support these and uh, they're, they're just different table types for, for each one that will be, will, will be rolling out in, in the next couple of months, starting with uh, Databricks, uh, that one, is slated for January, February. Snowflake is also in development in parallel and also looking around that timeline, February, March. And the related to that is semi-structured and complex data types, which is usually what these external tables contain. And this is strictly speaking, this is not a relational database feature. This is more of a NoSQL type of feature where you'll be able to model your, your semi-structured structure and format and support the, the formats and data types uh, like Avro, Orc, Parquet, um, JSON and work with those because again, more and more, even when you're working in, in Snowflake, Databricks, Azure, um, Delta Lake, you are interested in not so much as seeing that you have an, an object data type or a semi-structured data type, but you actually wanna dive in and either visualize or even model the structure of the nesting, the data types, the arrays that make up the, the data itself. So it's gonna, it's gonna be a, a big focus for us as we also look to potentially add uh, NoSQL database 
bases themselves like mongo for example is probably the most popular one that we're likely to start with and there's you know there's enough to keep us busy i did want to save some time i see we have some questions and and comments so you can let, let me take the first one and 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 then any anyone else now's the time if you want to write in we'll we'll try to get to as many of these as as possible so the first question and i guess we can whoever can take these um feel free to call out um are you catching up with the new snowflake feature create or alter table um the answer with any Snowflake feature is, is always going to be yes, or any feature for any of the cloud data platforms that we support. Uh, any new releases and new enhancements, we we always have to work to incorporate into our tool. And the question is, is when? So I don't have an exact timeline for this one, but yes, everything that Snowflake releases, like as I mentioned, uh, the, new, the new table types, are are also a big focus for the coming year and, and any other new functionality. So Keith was just mentioning the enhancement of the alter rename columns. Uh, so that one is is also very useful for it even works with um, not just in the project, but also across environments. So you can when you compare a table across a a live project to let's say a, a Snowflake environment, it can even detect based on data type and column order that these are the same column but renamed so it won't drop and it'll it'll uh, minimize potential issues of, of data loss so yes and external tables for databricks uh, this one is in jan february this one maybe even earlier it's uh i'm just being cautious but it's already, I believe, in, in development or testing, so coming soon. Okay, uh, let's see. There was something in the chat that I that I haven't covered. I don't think so. Nope. Okay, we have some comments from, from our other strategic advisor, Kent Graziano. Thank you so much for joining us. And I guess if no one else wants to write in, we can we can end it here. And I want to give the final word over to Gordon. And he has a proven and demonstrated ability to, to see the horizon while everyone is still waking up to the dawn <laughs> to wrap this all together and 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 give us an overview on on everything that we've discussed today and why it's why it matters. Yeah, sure thing. Thank you for that. Uh, for that, I think I have a couple bit. So th thank you. Um, you know, I think one of the things I've definitely seen in my career, right, and and, and I feel like processes and culture and people and tools are still catching up to this notion in some sense, is that we have like model. Why wasn't modeling popular for a while, or why did it have sort of a bad reputation? People thought is because people thought the modeling was something that was done in ivory tower all in the beginning. You had to get it perfect, and if you didn't get it perfect, uh, it wasn't worth doing, right? And so, in some sense, some of the parts of the, our our industry sort of abandoned modeling, and yet they were still modeling. People just didn't know they were doing it. What they were doing is they were doing it incrementally, without a lot of uh, intentionality, without foresight, without coordination, right? You know, arguably, you know, very much when we build. Uh, pipelines in DBT, we call them models, right? So here we have people who have such very expertise, technical, <clears throat> technical expertise, they are modeling. They're just not doing it from that ivory tower sort of centralized model that we thought, that we used to think of. So what I think SQL DBM has really done a great job of and is continuing to do is lead this cultural change or be part of this cultural change of how we work, right? We It's not just, you might, I'm going to reuse a term, but it's not just modeling. It's sometimes it's mapping. You know, when you build a map and you uncover topography, you go uncover what's there. You document it and you make it available for other people, right, organizations to use, to share that knowledge so they can coordinate. Well, I feel like we're at SQL DBM, we're really leaning into that. Modeling is happening all over the place now. 
and we're enabling, you know, and it's happening in other tools. You can do it inside SQL, SQL DBM. We prefer you to do it inside SQL DBM. There's lots of good reasons. But, but, but we could also be the hub of consistency where we're pulling all those little bits of piece of modeling together and mapping it, right? And showing you what's out there, you know? And, you know, if you've ever run SQL DBM against, oh, let's say a 18 month old DBT project that was done asynchronously ad hoc by 20 or 30 different developers, and you're trying to figure out these 10,000 tables you now have, right? You can see this really is a mapping exercise sometimes. You know? And when you have a topography, when you have a map, you can start applying judgment, right? You can start applying like decision-making around like, hmm, maybe it's time to simplify my model. <laughs> you know? Maybe all this complexity is costing me processing money, up to, you know, maybe it's costing me update effort and so on, right? Maybe it's costing me reliability. So I think that's where, you know, that's where we're going in a lot of ways from a philosophical perspective, these practical solutions. And it's really showing people like, modeling is not just nice to have. It's something you've had all along, but you could do it better. So how was that? I'm impressed. I, uh, my, my bar was set pretty high and you know, that, that cleared it by, by quite a bit. So I, I knew I picked the right guy for the job. Thank you, Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Of course. Okay. So it doesn't look like we have any more questions in, in the chat. And I just want to thank uh, all of our panelists for the great job in the presentation and all of you guys for, for showing up. And this will be shared, as we said, with the slide deck and the video. And as always, thanks for the great ideas. So, you know, we, you know, we're always taking the feedback from directly from the people who use the tool most and every day, which is you guys. So please, by all means, keep, keep sharing, keep commenting, tagging us when, when you have good ideas and, and your wishes, as you'll see, will, will come to reality. We'll be discussing them on the next call in a year <laughs> from now. Okay. So thank you very much and bye.